appreciate it if you could put your mobile phones on silent or better yet, turn them off completely during the inaugural lecture um, so as to not uh, you know, disrupt the proceedings in any way. Um, another announcement is um, if you should need the restrooms, they're on the building on, on your right. So you can go out either this way or, or, or the top and head to the right. The restrooms are there. They are signposted and there'll be people showing you the way. Um, one important thing is, in the event of any emergencies or any, um, well, God forbid, fire or anything, um, I'd like everyone to proceed in an orderly fashion up towards those two doors and head towards your left to the meeting point on the road, on, uh, uh, on the left. There are people who will be ushering you, but I'd like you to stay calm and just proceed in an orderly fashion. All right, now that's out of the way, we should be starting soon. I think we'll give them a couple of minutes to get here before we get started. All right, thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to ask you to take your seats. Announcing the arrival of the Deputy Vice Chancellor of Academic and International Affairs, Dr. Professor Dr. Awang Bukhiba bin Awang Mahmud, accompanied by the deliverer of our inaugural lecture today, Professor Dr. Stephanie Sharmila Pillay. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, if I could ask you to rise for our national anthem, followed by the University of Malaya song. Thank you.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to welcome each and every one of you to the inaugural lecture of Professor Dr. Stephanie Sharmila Pillay. To move the proceedings along, I would like to invite the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Professor Dr. Awang Bulgiba, to come forward and introduce our Professor Dr. Stephanie. Dr. Awang? Thank you, Dr. Sarin. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ali Ali LPU, sorang lah, Ali LPU. <laughs> Dekan Dean Stephanie and uh, Professor Asma and uh, warga-warga UM yang saya hormati sekian. Now, um, a very good morning. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And uh, thank you very much for coming to this inaugural lecture by Prof. Uh, Stephanie Shamila Pillay. Now, as uh, DVC for Research and Innovation as well as Academic International for the last uh, five and a half years, my term is coming to an end in eight days' time. So, <laughs> now, Prof. Shamila, please don't throw anything at me. <laughs> I'm counting on my days to, to 31st March. It has been my pleasure to, to chair several inaugural lectures. And among the inaugural lectures which I've chaired have been a director of uh, UMCOE, the pengarah of uh, PPUM, uh, uh, pengarah of the current pengarah of uh, AEI, the Asia Europe Institute, as well as three deans that I can remember, Prof. Zanaria, uh, Prof. Azwan, and of course, uh, Prof. Stephanie. I'm supposed to be on leave today, prior to beginning my, <laughs> my long leave, but I decided that uh, I needed to cancel my leave to, to come and chair this lecture. Now, uh, Prof. Stephanie, of course, is no stranger to, to all of you. She complicated her, uh, completed her matriculation and bachelor's degree. Not complicated, sorry. <laughs> you must forgive me. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a language person, so sometimes I do get, I do get mixed up between complicated and completed. <laughs> no, I'm not dyslexic either. <laughs> She completed her matriculation and bachelor's degree at Christchurch College, Canterbury, now called Canterbury Christchurch University in the UK under a Ministry of Education Scholarship. And uh, true to form, she obtained a first class Bachelor of Education Honours degree in teaching of English as a second language then, awarded by the University of Kent. She returned to teach at the Senior Methodist Girls' School in Kuala Lumpur, her alma mater, and later joined the University of Malaya three years later uh, in 1993 as a language teacher. So she has come a long way from being a guru bahasa. You know, a guru bahasa in uh, what was then, was it Pusat Bahasa? It was Pusat Bahasa. She subsequently completed her master's in English as a second language and her PhD in speech disfluencies at the faculty while working full time. I sometimes wonder what this, uh, I know what influence is, but I'm not sure what disfluence is. <laughs> This was the exception of one year study leave under a Commonwealth split site scholarship uh, where she spent a year at the University of Newcastle in the UK working with Professor Gerard uh, Doherty. Stephanie was appointed lecturer here in this faculty in 1999, a senior lecturer in 2005 and moved rapidly to become an associate professor in 2008 and subsequently a full professor in 2016. She is currently Dean of the Faculty of Languages and Linguistics. Prior to that, she was Deputy Dean for postgraduates from 2014 to 2016. And from 2016 to 2013, she was the Deputy Director and subsequently the Director of UM Center for Industrial Training and Relations, which later expanded to include community engagement. That was when I first got to know uh, Prof. Stephanie, when I was the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation because at the time, she travels under the uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Innovation. Her main area of research is acoustics, phonetics, and language documentation. And of late, she has been working on the sound system of Malacca Portuguese, an endangered language in Malaysia. She obtained a grant to document and archive Malacca Portuguese from the Endangered Language Documentation Program at SOAS in the UK. And apparently, she is the first Malaysian to be awarded this kind of grant. 
the accolades don't end there. She is, so far, the only Malaysian thus far to be selected as an Ian Gordon Fellow at the School of Linguistics and Applied Language Studies, Victoria University of Wellington, New Zealand. Now, Prof. Stephanie recently completed a project on the sounds of Malacca Portuguese under an FRGS grant. FRGS is a grant awarded by the Ministry of Higher Education. However, of course, Prof. Stephanie's work goes beyond researching for its own sake. She obtained grants from UMCAS to work with representatives of the Malacca Portuguese Eurasian Association to help with language revitalization efforts. For those of you who do not know what UMCAS does, this is part of this is a unit which which does uh, university social responsibility, community engagement projects. And in the recent STARA ranking, we were rated very well in this regard because we have a number of projects where we transfer knowledge to the community. So not just knowledge residing within the university walls. Under this community engagement knowledge sharing grants from UMCAS, she co-produced an audio CD and a learning resource with community members. She's still looking at avenues to create more resources for Malacca Portuguese. Recently, Prof. Stephanie has also been awarded a Newton Unku Omar Advanced Researcher Fellowship from the British Academy and the Academy of Sciences Malaysia, together with Professor Peter K. Austin from SOAS. The project aims to develop training and support for the documentation of endangered languages in Malaysia. Together with Professor Austin, she has led talks, workshops, and practical sessions in Kuala Lumpur, Sabah, and Sarawak on the theory and methods of language documentation. Prof. Stephanie is also well known for her work on Malaysian English, particularly acoustic analysis of its sounds, which has been published in ISI and Scopus Index journals, as well as books. She has been keynote, plenary, and featured speaker at many international conferences, speaking on both issues related to English and the documentation and revitalization of endangered languages. On the national front, she has been a member of the Evaluation Committee of the Ministry of Higher Education's High COE since the program's inception in 2008. She has also evaluated programs for the Malaysian Ministry of Education's English Language Teaching Center. She was, until 2017, I guess the duties of a dean, I think, uh, probably too much to continue, but she was, until last year, the chief editor of the Malaysian English Language Teaching Association's Journey of, Journal of ELT Research, which is now included in the em Emerging Sources Citation Index in uh, ISI. Apart from her administrative duties, research and language revitalization projects, Stephanie also teaches phonetics and phonology at the postgraduate level, supervises both PhD and master's students, and mentors junior colleagues. It is therefore my singular pleasure to invite Professor Stephanie Shamila Pillai to deliver her inaugural lecture entitled From Waveforms and Spectrograms to Language Documentation and Revitalization. Dr. Stephanie. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for being here. Um, I'm, I'm really happy to see um, colleagues, ex-colleagues, my, my own supervi ex-supervisors, mentors, ex-bosses, uh, my friends from Christchurch College, yay, members of the Blanca Portuguese community, and of course, my, my family, colleagues from the other institutes. So to everyone here, and my students, of course, okay, thank you so much for coming today and for sharing this day. Um, with me and allowing me to share my work with you. So let me um, proceed. You know, um, spoken language is an amazing phenomenon and basically I'm going to show you um, my journey and I'm going to try and take you on a journey, I hope, okay? Um, from language and sounds to acoustic analysis, okay? What fascinated me about sounds and why I ended up doing acoustic analysis, and I'll talk a little bit about languages in Malaysia because I think that's important and many of us actually are, are a bit clueless about the number of languages and the state of our languages in Malaysia, yeah? And then I'll talk about um, 
the language loss, the fact that most of our languages you know, are in danger and how my work with Malacca Portuguese is trying to address this issue. Yeah? And then I'll also talk about the challenges and hopefully end with um, why we should share and engage. So it's a very feel good kind of talk, I hope. Okay. Right, so language and sounds, ladies and gentlemen, if you think about it, right, um, we are born capable of producing any sound, language sound, in any language in the world, right? So it's got nothing to do with our ethnicity. It's, it's not a biological thing, okay? So let me show you this video, which um, I, I really like. So let's can you play that? And just take a minute to... Singapore, Singapore, Singapore. Now, we are going to talk about the people who are in Tamil. And we are going to talk about the Chinese and the Tamil people. We are going to talk about the Chinese and the Indian people. We are going to talk about the Chinese and the Indian people. We are going to talk about the Chinese and the Indian people. So, you know, if, if you are if of Chinese origin and you grow up in a Tamil speaking home, you end up speaking Tamil as your first language. Or if you are of Tamil origin and grow up, and you go to school in Australia, for example, you probably speak English with an Australian accent, right? So two things I want to highlight. One is that the language that we end up learning as our first language or our home language has nothing to do with our ethnicity. And the second thing is that language is related to our identity, and that's why language is so important and why it's so important to preserve heritage languages. Okay, right. So now, if you look at this map from the World Atlas of Language Structures, I just want you to see the red dots because the red dots are all those languages which have like more than 33, 34 consonants. Can you imagine, for those of us who speak Malay and English, mainly Malay and English, if you learn these languages, you'll have to learn like maybe 50 consonants in that language, right? So what I'm trying to show is that, right, um, there are so many sounds in languages, right? More than 800 sounds in all the languages in the world. So how come we are capable of learning all these languages, uh, all these sounds, and then we sort of start only, only producing, per perceiving, and, and producing the sounds in our languages? See, like, it's such an amazing thing that happens. So there's some research that um, has shown that uh, we actually start sort of perceiving the sounds in our languages while we're in our mother's wombs, right? So uh, kind of uh, be careful what you play to your baby, right? <laughs> or, or say to your baby. No, they're not going to learn the bad words you utter, okay? But, right. And even more amazing, because these days in Malaysia especially, most of our children, right, are growing up in multilingual homes, right? I'll, I'll give you a minute to, to read through this cartoon, okay? Um, <laughs> I see the fast readers were laughing first. <laughs> okay. the, the point is that children can, can perceive and learn more than one language at the same time, right? And there are a lot of studies that have shown this. Um, so, see, these are all the amazing things when it comes to um, sounds, right? And, and basically, we also know that around 12 months before one, if you hear recordings of children, you can already see a grammar in their language. There is a system. Nothing is random in language, really. That's why we do linguistics, because it's a system. It's a science, OK? Right, so I've, I've been fascinated with sounds for a long time. And if we look at um, sounds, they're not just sounds, right? We have to put them together to make meaning. But if we look at, say, if you are going to make the sound or p, right? Um, so look at your, your lips will be closed, obviously, and then you have to release them to make the p or the p. But if you want to make a m, your lips are also closed, right? And the only thing that's different, why you can hear me say mm, but you can't hear me say if I don't release my lips and I get out of breath, is because of something that happens here. Your velum or soft palate to some of you here has moved allowing the air to come out through your nasal cavity, right? So it's physical. Sounds are also a lot to do with the, the uh, physical properties, unlike, say, uh, in the syntacticians and the, the, the other people here are going to like shout at me. But yeah, that's why I'm fascinated with sounds, because it has a real, real dimension, right? It's not just 
theory. Okay? <laughs> yes, yes, my friends from Christchurch are like, remember our phonetics lecturer? Yes, we loved him. <laughs> okay, and then sounds in a, sounds in a language, right? Um, we, because there are all these, remember these 800 sounds, and there are sounds that I'll never be able to produce, all the click languages that we find in South Africa, for example. But look, just look at Malay and English, right? When we spell, we spell, spell a word like tepi or tip or tin with a T. But they're not the same T's at all. And that's why you get people who are learning Malay, who are uh, English speakers, for example, saying tepi jalan, Ikat tepi, all right, because they are using an English ter. English ter is said with your tongue at your alveola. Alveola is that, that bumpy part behind your teeth. Okay, if you haven't come for my, my phonetics class, here's a lesson for you. Okay, so that is ter, right, like tin or, or tip. But for tepi, you cannot do it the same thing. You have to move your tongue, tip of your tongue, to the back of your upper teeth or on your teeth, all right? So you get tepi. See, you can see my tongue, right? I always tell my students in phonetics class, you cannot be shy, okay? Because you're going to make all sorts of faces, all right? Um, and, and so you, you just cannot be shy. So people usually leave my class by the first week. You know, add and drop. I get a lot of drops. It's not for people who are shy. So, so this is how languages make use of all the, the sounds that are available differently, right? And I'll give another example. Then what they do, because it's a system, you have to start putting them together in some kind of pattern. And that's what starts making languages different as well. So not just that we use different kinds of ter, but we may have ng or ng. English has ng, Malay has ng, but they don't, they're not patterned in the same way because in Malay you can say nganga, ngeri. You can start a syllable with nga. You can't do that in English, right? Can you think of a word where English starts with a nga? English can only end, a syllable can only end with a ng. So same sound, different rules. And that's what I look at, the rules. Not just the qualities or the properties of the sounds, but also the rules. Okay? Right. And if we look at and some other examples, if you think about how you say the word, this in English this is called pie, okay? And no, it's not James Bond, it's not the answer I want, but James Bond is a... Spy, very good, okay. The p is a different kind of p, right? When you say pie and you say, you don't say spy and spit at the next person, the person in front of you. So languages also do this. The same sound in a language may have different qualities depending on where that sound is. Again, rules, okay? Because I'm just doing this so that, you know, people who think linguistics is not a science, it's a science, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, and this one is meant to be um, cart. So the, the last sound in carts, the plural of cart is carts, okay? And the last sound in this word is, do you realize something? They are not the same. Spelled with an S, one is S, one is Z. Again, rules. And this rule is related to the grammar of the language, right? It's plural, but you don't use the same S. You don't say sir for every um, sound. It depends on what comes before. So t has sir and d has z. And I won't go into the rules, but there is a rule there, right? Okay. Okay. Now, another thing that we do, right? Okay. Like, yes, this is not teeth, okay? When you say the word tin, this is basically how your lips look like, right? Okay, tin. But when you say the word twin, what happens? Look at your lips before you even say the word. How do your lips go? You already do this before you even say the word. So what's happening here? Okay, there's a lot of connection. It's also cognitive, right? So the message, your brain says, I'm going to say the word twin. And your articulary, um, all your organs are getting ready to say it even before you say it. So sounds influence each other a lot. Sounds are like, you know, um, like teenagers, okay, sorry teenagers, okay? They are very influenced by their peers, the neighboring sounds as well. So all these things happen in sounds, right? And um, I'll, I'll give you another example. And before I go into this example, we've been talking about segments, okay? Individual sounds. But actually sounds are more than that because we've got stress, we've got intonation. Otherwise, we would all sound like this and it would be terrible. We'll sound like the parking machine that says, 
please present your card or present your card. Okay, right. So when I this is me saying the word faculty, and because faculty has so it's not faculty uh, by the way. Okay, it's faculty. All right. Uh, <laughs> Right, so how do, we, how do we hear stress? We hear stress because, all right, um, if you look at the yellow lines, that's how loud I was. So I was louder at the first syllable than the other syllables, and my pitch, which is the blue line, was also higher. So what am I trying to say? These are the other properties that work together with individual sounds, individual syllables, so that we can hear stress. Otherwise, you will hear faculty. Right, but because I'm louder and my pitch is higher, you hear and make my vowel is probably longer, as you can see here, right? So it's faculty, right? So it's not just sounds, right? It sounds that, so there's a pool of sounds and languages use different pools. They may use similar pools, but they use them differently. They put them in different patterns. They, they work differently. And then there are all these prosodic features like pitch, all right? How loud we are. Um, and we use this in rhythm as well. So there's a lot of things going on in, in sounds. So now you can, you can try to imagine why I have my words like that out for me, right? Okay. Um, and in some languages, the tone is also inherent. So you cannot say, you, can, you can't speak Chinese, okay, Cantonese or Mandarin without using tone. So let me see if I can make this work. You can see the blue lines, these are the tones. Different tones will give you different meanings, okay? C, B. Okay, you can hear it, right? Of course you can hear it. <laughs> C, B. Okay, so example. So some languages, it doesn't matter whether I say like, um, hello or hello, but in Chinese it will matter because you could be saying a really bad word or cursing someone and saying I love you, so. Of course, there isn't that. Okay, so let me move on to acoustic analysis, okay, just to, to give you an um, idea of what's happening. So here's some of my work just to show you, okay, because when we analyze sounds, what, and I've worked with my students, some of them are here today, um, and my colleagues as well here and, and abroad, and we look at different things, right? So we've been looking at, for example, varieties of English, and this is looking at the rhythm. Is the rhythm of... Um, the Malay speakers, Chinese speakers, and Indian speakers in Malaysia, do we sound the same or do we have different rhythms, okay? We look at um, also pitch, okay? So when we, if you listen to Malaysian news, for example, and the news reader might say something like, uh, the Prime Minister said today that, okay, when we, when we track the intonation, it's there, but it's not very, um, it's not very modulated. But if we say, take something from the BBC or CNN, you'll find the Prime Minister said today that there's a lot more intonation patterns, okay? So not to say we don't have, but ours is a little bit flat, la, okay? We don't like to be too excited, okay? All right, so we look at that, all right? Because some people who are not used to our accent will say, which was the, the new information? What, which was the, the important information? They may not get it. Okay, they may not get it. All right, then we also look at, um, this is my with my student looking at Achenese, Achenese in Banda Aceh compared to Achenese in Kedah, in, um, in, in Kampong Aceh. And also students who are teaching German, oops, sorry, okay, who are teaching German. Um, and we looked at this, because this is an exciting thing happening in Malaysia, and especially this faculty. We've got students who are coming from uh, Malaysian students who are now learning a foreign language, okay, Spanish, German, Italian, French, Japanese. So they already have Malay, English, and for some of them, Mandarin and Tamil. So they have four languages. In fact, this, the new language might be their fifth or even sixth language if you count their Malay dialect that they know, okay? And we've, we're trying to see the influence is not the first language. The influence is also the other languages that they speak. All right, so it's, it's a, and this is a growing area in the field of, of phonetics, looking at third language learning or other, uh, other language learning, okay. Right, in terms of Malaysian English, okay, just, want, just to show you some of the things we find, one of our very um, characteristic features, and I do this, okay, I don't have a distinction between but and but, they basically sound the same, and if you tell, if the Malaysian speakers here say no, I say but, 
Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I don't believe you, okay. Um, it's unlikely that we do. We just do not distinguish. This is one of a character characteristic feature of Malaysian English, even among fluent speakers, okay? And so this would have implications if you're a teacher to understand these features. Uh, and, and if you go around forcing your students to say, no, it's, it's you know, it's but or part, okay? Uh, maybe there's another technique to use rather than make them say something that no one else in Malaysia would probably say and say, what are you speaking? And this is when the, you speaking uh, comes in because you sound weird, <laughs> all right? Okay. So don't speaking, just speak like your, yourself, all right? Okay, so from a, from a linguistic um, perspective, we're not looking at bad pronunciation or, um, you know, this is a bastardized version of a language or a bad version. No, we don't. So that's not what linguists should be doing. Linguists should be describing a language, looking at its system and patterns, and trying to find out why those patterns exist. Because there are so many reasons why it could happen. It is not our job to discriminate and to, to, to encourage discrimination. And we know that with accents and language and pronunciation, that happens a lot, right? When we listen to someone on the phone, we are already making judgments about that person's educational background, ethnic background, and all sorts of things. Whether that person has money, can I sell this person you know, this car today, or can, will that person get the loan today from me? So we do all kinds of judgments, and that's why it's actually important to study these features. Okay. Right, and another thing we've been finding in Malaysian English, this is, this is like, for many of us, we say bed, bread, head, and not bed, bread, and head. Maybe some of you do, but most of us don't, okay? And so we actually have not one E vowel, okay? We actually have the A and the E, as in bad, mad, fat. So we, have, we actually distinguish that. And if you look at current descriptions, it seems that we only have one. Actually, we have two. Okay, and we do the same for this. Well, not all of us. This is quite strange. I found this in some, some speakers, and I'm still trying to find out why this is so. So for some people, this is court and force, like Malay, o, orang, and this is caught and fought. Probably not very long. Not caught, not fought, but just caught and fought. Okay? Because we don't... <laughs> yeah. so, right. Um, although I must say, though, we are finding a difference between things that fluent speakers do, Malaysian speakers do, and learners do. Right? So fluent speakers may not have um, pet and fat, but they may make the pet longer or the court longer. They don't have a difference in their quality, but in their length. Okay? So let me just move on to languages in Malaysia because I want to start talking about the, the state of the languages in Malaysia. Okay? Right. And so we have, and every time I look at some data, the, the number goes down. I swear last year I saw it was over 100. Uh, but the recent one that I've looked at from, uh, from the, the book that I have, the recent Ethnologue book, not the website, is 93 living languages. Okay? Um, and among them, of course, is, um, is, this is, okay, hang on, all right. And, and this is, this is, let me just show this. All right, and that's Bahasa Isyarat Malaysia. It's counted among one of our languages, okay? Right, and if I, I don't expect you to, to see or to, to read all this, but I just wanted to show you, these are just the indigenous languages. We've got 80% of these 93 living languages are indigenous languages, and just to look at the list, and this is just Peninsula Malaysia, right? That's, uh, that's one of my colleague's daughter. Dania, thank you for lending me your hand, okay? And um, this is Sarawak. Okay, and um, even more languages, okay? I'm not going to go through all the, the names, and Sabah. So just, just to, to point out to you that um, there are so, so many languages. So in Peninsular Malaysia, we're talking about Jahai, Jahut, Jakun, Semai, Mahmeri, Temia, Temuan, some of which my colleagues here are, have been working or have worked on, okay? Uh, and then, of course, in Sarawak, we have Iban, Bidayu, Melanau, Sabah, Kadazan Dusun, or Kadazan Dusun. Um, it depends on how you look at it, Bajau, Moro, and so many more languages. So, unfortunately, ready for bad news? <laughs> okay. Right? About 70% um, of our living languages, right? So, these, uh, these from the red onwards are your living languages, um, are, are considered as being in danger. Okay, so everything from the yellow and the red, yellow and red, these are the examples of languages that are considered 
endangered or in trouble. Now, what does that mean? That essentially means that there is uh, less and less intergenerational transmission, meaning that grandparents are not speaking to the grandchildren. Parents, more importantly, are not speaking to their children in that language. They're using something else. Maybe the Malay dialect uh, that's around them or the, uh, a Chinese language, for example, that's around, that's because they do business with Chinese people and so on. So eventually, if you don't learn the language from your parents, or your grandparents, or it's not spoken in the family, what will happen? You stop speaking it, right? And then if when you get married, you can't speak that language to your children anymore, so it's going to die. And if that language is only in your community, that means no one else in the world speaks your language, you are the only speakers of that language, that's it. Once the community stops speaking the language, that will be the end of that language, all right? So among the languages in trouble, uh, uh, Melaka Portuguese Creole, okay, or Melaka Portuguese, uh, also sometimes called Papia Cristang, and two other Creoles in Melaka. Melaka actually has three Creoles. So Creoles happen because of language contact between locals, uh, between different languages. So we've got Baba Malay, and we also have uh, Chiti Malay in, in Melaka, and all three are considered endangered, yeah? So this, this brings me to the, the concept of language loss, right? So language loss uh, has many reasons why it happens, okay? Um, and some people feel, you know what, it's a natural thing, right? Like animals go extinct, so it's like the dodo of the languages, if you, if you like. So, you know, we have to survive in this world. So, and if you look at languages in, in any country or any, any community, you've got the national language probably, right? So every country will have at least one national language, all right? And one or more official languages. We in Malaysia have one official language and it's the same as our national language. Singapore has four official languages, yeah? Um, it's really interesting because on Air, an Air Asia flight recently, I actually heard announcements in actually five languages. It was a flight to Thailand. It had Malay, for the first time, Malay, English, Tamil, Mandarin. I don't know if this is a new policy for Air Asia, and of course th uh, Thai, because we were going to Thailand. Because never before have I heard all four of our main languages, so which uh, I think it's a good good thing. I mean, it was the first time I've heard t announcement on the flight in Tamil, and uh, I was like, okay, this is quite interesting, and and Mandarin, of course. Then, of course, this may or may not be the same, the language of education, and we know the situation in Malaysia, where we still have uh, vernacular schools, primary schools, right, Tamil, Mandarin, uh, but at secondary school, all government schools are Malay medium. Well, there are some Chinese schools which still, there are, in, there are independent tam, uh, Chinese schools. And now you know that m there has been an increase in the number of Malaysian students that have gone into international schools who are doing their studies, their education, mainly in English. Um, I'm not going to talk about it now, but to me, that seems to be going back to the sort of pre and just immediately post-colonial times where you have English education for the elite in urban areas versus all the other language educations and what's happened to national curriculum, national unity, you know, somehow. No one's talking about this, but I think we should because it's actually a very important agenda for the country, yeah? Um, and of course, you, you then have global languages. So, you, so if your languages here are not one of the global languages, so you might decide, many countries are now saying, we must learn Mandarin because Mandarin is a, you know important language, global in terms of trade, in terms of power, okay? And then if your heritage language is none of these, okay, and usually, and usually we're talking about minority communities, then, well, you just face disappearing after a while if you don't do anything about it, right? Okay, okay. This was like, you know, <laughs> didn't mean this to happen, but yeah. I think it proves my point. Okay, so competition from other languages, right? Okay, so yes, this is what, and, and so it comes. I talked about identity earlier, and one of the reasons uh, that we, we often forget, and sometimes it's only when we grow older that we regret not learning our heritage languages, because then we start questioning. And in a country we are state-defined, but you know, our race or our, our racial background is state-defined. You are Malay, Chinese, Indian, or Bumputra, and Others. Imagine if you are an others. Some of you are others, right? Yeah, okay. I mean, who, who are you? I'm an other. <laughs> okay. So, issues of identity are important because 
because by destroying someone's uh, uh, heritage, including their language, you could actually destroy their identity. They become part of the masses. Okay, they become part of the masses. Um, and one of the most in, in interesting and I think very important things that is emerging from research uh, on indigenous and minority languages is this, that non-existent, okay, something is moving, but we don't have earthquakes here, right? Linguistic rights may have a negative impact now, not only on overall well-being of the minority, but also status, because when you are not confident of yourself, you could end up in debt, in you drink, you may be on drugs. Now, those things have, those kind of social issues have been found in many, many indigenous minority communities, okay, where they just like, nobody cares, your language doesn't matter, your culture doesn't matter, you are just an other, you are nobody, even worse. So, when our self-esteem is down, it affects our health, it affects our economic and social well-being. So having people's um, uh, heritage survive is actually very, very important, not just for, oh, you know, just for the sake of aesthetics. Oh, let's learn this because it's another language we can learn. It's more than that, yeah? Okay, so this brings me to the gap that I found myself in this, you know, ha having this gap when I was doing my own research, right? So what, what do we do? We go to research community, right? We present, we publish, because the university requires us to publish, right? Uh, otherwise, Prof Awang will have my back, like, you haven't met your KPI, okay? <laughs> right? But that's, that's, a, that's the academic world, right? Every academic will have to do that. And then maybe we, we review our research and say, oh, you know, there's something else I found in my research. Uh, I think I want to go and explore further, right? So, so what do we do? So we go back to the research community. And essentially, we are like half circle, right? Uh, we, we are here, and then we, we are here. So what happens to giving back to the research, or giving back from our research to the communities, right? Not many of us then think, okay, I'll just take, I'll just go, you know, okay, I'll, here's a copy of a dictionary which they may not even know how to use, or they, they don't, don't have, sometimes, actually most of the time, they don't even have access to those materials, right? The thesis written, the, the dictionaries written, uh, phrase books, the grammars, they have no access to it. And even if they do, I mean, you give a thesis to a community, what are they going to do with your thesis? Even you don't read your thesis after you've, you've right? After you've graduated, you got your scroll, you keep, it, you keep it. Tell me the truth. How many of you have been reading your thesis? Like, you know, yes, okay, thank you, all right? So, and then you expect the community to do what with it, okay? They probably use it to, you know, hold up a table or something, all right? So, I am really, and Prof. Prof. Awang, Dr. Prof. Awang mentioned this, right? I am really, really grateful to the University of Malaya because it has been pushing us to think about the, how our research can be impactful. What is, the, what is the impact of our research, right? And sometimes when we do languages, we think, hey, yeah, you know, what can I do? I'm not a scientist, you know, I haven't like, like uh, come up with a water filtration system that can, that can provide water for flood-ridden areas, right? So, you think that it's insignificant. But I think this grant, questions that and it asks us to go back to the communities and ask the communities, do you need anything from us? How can we help you? Because of course, if they, they say, no, we don't want anything, then you go off, right? Uh, but if they say, yeah, I think you could you know, help us to develop classes or materials in the language, help us to, to, help us to learn how to teach the language because we don't have pedagogic skills, that's where you come in. And the, we have small grants. It's competitive, by the way, okay? It's not just given, given out. We have to go for interviews now. We have to prove that we are actually working with communities um, and it's becoming more and more competitive to get. Of course, at the national level, we also have the knowledge transfer funds. So we are going towards um, thinking about sharing our research with others. And um, so I'd like to share with you and to tell people, to tell all of you here that it's really possible to do it and we should actually start thinking about sharing uh, and engaging with communities. So, Malacca Portuguese, um, also sometimes uh, called Papia Cristang, rather controversially, I won't go into the, the debate of that, <laughs> okay? Right, so we, I mean, those of you who still remember your history, right? Uh, some not so recent, okay? <clears throat> um, so, so, since the Portuguese came in 1511, they were, they were in Malacca for about, what, 130 years or so, right? 
And um, they, they b essentially what happened was there was a lot of unions with local people and, all, and the language contact with Malay of that time and other languages that were in Melaka. Remember Melaka was very cosmopolitan in those days, right? So from the unions between the Portuguese and, and local people, right, grew a Creole, a language called Melaka Portuguese or Papia Cristang. Now this language is not an antique version of Portuguese. Uh, and it's not like a half-half mixture of Malay and Portuguese. No, it's not. Okay, it's got elements of, its uh, vocabulary is very much based on Portuguese, but of course after time, we're almost 500 plus years now, it doesn't sound like the Portuguese you will hear in Portugal, okay, or even Brazil. And, and that's what happens to languages, right? All, I mean, English doesn't sound the same from, from the time of Chaucer. It was more French then, right? And uh, Shakespeare. So, so that's a natural phenomenon for people who say, oh, you know, the youngsters now are saying yeah, park rather than park, and that's wrong. Hey, get on with the times, okay? So let's show you some examples for those of you who have never encountered. And of course, we've got some native speakers here. Put up your hand as Sarah and Philo. Yay, okay. So you can practice. If you've got your postcards, if you manage to get the postcards, you can practice with them later, okay? All right. So let's see some examples here, okay? So this is uh, my family. You're also familiar, okay? Ten quarto genti. So I have four people in my family. So you can see the structure is um, similar. It's not Malay, but it's similar to Malay, okay? Whereas it's lost a lot of the complexities that you will find in Portuguese in terms of the grammar, in terms of the pronunciation. Here's another example, okay? Uh, Tim likes to play football. Tim gosta brinca bola, okay? So Tim gosta brinca bola, okay? And of course, we have bola in Malay, okay? So that's from Portuguese, la? okay? From Portuguese, okay, right, okay. okay. Right, now, what's happening in Malacca? So, I just looked at the recent statistics at the Department of Statistics Malaysia, and there, there are about 3,900 others. It, it is an official category, okay? And out of the, somewhere in the 3,900 are your Malacca Portuguese. This is just Malacca. So, you can imagine that the number is very, very small, yeah? And this has implications for survival of, the survival of the language. Okay, so if we um, move on, and this is one of the reasons why Malacca Portuguese still survives in Malacca especially, is because in the 1930s, um, many Portuguese Malaccans were, were housed, were placed in a little area called, uh, right now we, we call it Kampong Portuguese, okay? Uh, or Padri Sechang because it was the Padri's land, because it was priests, two priests that helped to get this land from, at that time, the British, uh, the British government or administrators. Now, because people still stay on there, okay, um, and from a linguistic point of view, it's quite interesting to see Malay, English, and then the, the Jawi use of the sign, right? And because people still live there in the Portuguese settlement, right, the language is still used. Right. Um, however, we are finding that as time goes on, and um, many, some of my colleagues have also uh, done work on that, uh, Prof Maya, Prof Arida, um, did, did work on that, looking at the vitality of the language. Um, more and more younger speakers, those below, say, 40, are not as fluent in the language as the older speakers, okay? Uh, because they go to school, they learn in Malay, right? And they use a lot of English, uh, colloquial English with their friends. So many of them are switching to English, okay, as a home language as well. So you'll find parents speaking to their children in, in, in like a Portuguese, and then the children will answer them in English. Okay, so more and more what will happen is the younger generation, when they have children, will be using, they will be mixing a lot between some words in Malacca Portuguese, but they will increasingly use English. Okay, so that's the danger. Even though they are in one area, that's a danger. Uh, th that still is a danger that the language will disappear. Yeah. Okay. So so what? So what? You know, because many people outside of um, outside of Malacca have switched to English for a long time, even during the British time, when people were were being educated, they stopped speaking Malacca Portuguese to their children. Right. So whole generations who are now in their seventies late 60s, can't speak it outside of Malacca, right? Uh, but in the Malacca, in, in, in Malacca itself, being a tourist spot, 
this has economic value, right? Um, and if you lose your language, you risk losing all your cultural practices from your dance, your festivals, uh, in Trudeau, this is San Pedro, okay? Uh, and of course, the lovely food that you get, your curry double. I think there might be curry double at refreshments later, okay? Just saying so that you will stay, okay? Uh, and then, yeah, so, so you, will, you are at risk of losing a lot of things, okay? Not just the, the language, okay? Right, so, do the com does the community want their language to survive? Okay, one of the things that my, my PhD student, my former PhD student, uh, Wen Yi, she was looking at the revitalization uh, issues in Malacca, and one of the things she found that people were saying, yeah, you come, you take, you go, right? And then, it's not for us. It's not for us. You, you come, you write, you get your PhD, you know, you get your publication, and that's it. So, it's for their own. And that is a sentiment, I think, that many community members feel, you know. Um, and so, I think, really, not I think, I know and I feel strongly that we need to move away from this grab and go. This is not take away, you know, okay. And moving to engaging communities, all right. And do people want it to survive? Of course they do. And we get this from many, many people, right. I don't want our language to die, so I'll keep on speaking. And when they say Portuguese here, they mean Malacca Portuguese, okay. Um, until the last day, and I'll pass it on to my grandchildren because I don't want it to die. But these are, it's old people, these are old people. And once they die, what if the, their children don't pass it on to their, the next generation? So there is a danger, right? So will it be there forever? Well, well, I don't know. Okay, so we need to do a lot more. And, and I'm just giving you an example of quite a, a language that's quite... You know, it's endangered, but there's a lot going on. There are many other languages where you're down to 50 speakers already and nothing is going on. So those languages, maybe the next 10 years will not exist anymore, okay? Right. So when we did our work, how do we engage with the community? So we have, before me, people have done work already, okay? People have done research, people have produced work, people like Joan Marbeck, uh, Alan Baxter, and um, many others, right? So we move on from there. Okay, and then I started to document the language, and this is uh, accessible for the public. It's an online archive with SOAS. Okay, and of course, there's ongoing research from FRGS, UMRG, which will keep going because we need the research in order to develop a language, all right? Um, and thus far, we have done the audio CD that Prof. Awang talked about. This was to document prayers and hymns in the language because people had forgotten how to say the prayers and um, they wanted to know. Not just people in Malaysia, actually people outside, in fact, who had left Malaysia already. Um, and we also produced the book very recently, both using UM, University of Malaya, um, community engagement grants, okay? So ongoing as well, because we realized that training is very important. So under the Newton grant, we are actually training people to do proper documentation. Because documentation is not just taking photos, taking videos, and that's it. Okay, I think a lot of that is, it lies somewhere in this faculty as well. Probably mold-ridden mold video, you know, which then how to get back. It's almost, even if you use the technology, you can't get everything back. So we need to teach people how to document properly and, and keep it in a place that we can still access it and in a format. Formats are important these days, right? So you see linguists need to know a little bit about technology, need to know uh, a little bit about uh, recording techniques as well. Because if you save in a, in a format that's very and then later, not even 10 years, five years from now, nobody can, can uh, I mean, you, you have the your diskettes, you know, the square diskettes, I'm showing my age, but you know, okay? And, and then you can't access those anymore, right? I mean, most of our laptops don't even have CD players now. That's how far we are, how fast we are advancing. So it's actually important to keep in touch with technology. And sometimes going simple is better than trying to go too sophisticated, okay? Right, so let's look at the, the book. I'm just going to give you the example from the book. Uh, and we worked with, very closely with the representatives from the Malacca Portuguese Eurasian Association. Uh, the president is Mr. Michael Singho, and we've got two representatives here from Malacca, Hilo uh, Singho, and Sarah Santa Maria, who worked with me on the book, and also Adri Philip, and my other, my other colleagues and friends, okay? So um, this book, 
is now being used. Sarah uses this book to teach the children in the Portuguese settlement. Okay, um, and we have had lots of requests from people outside Malaysia who want this book because they have no one else to speak this language to. They remember bits and pieces from their, you know, speaking to their parents or grandparents, people Eurasians in Australia, and they use this book to help them to reconnect. And uh, and of course, um, is Sarah, Philo, they have, they've got Facebook pages which got the book by giving phrases and recordings of, of what we have in the book, okay, and beyond. Now, in doing this project, these are, the, these are the things we had to go through, right? So you have to be willing to travel, you have to be willing to go to Malacca, or I have to bring them here, okay, either way, but uh, you, you are actually using people's time, right? You're asking people who have got to, who, they have their own livelihoods, they have their own things. Is that a sign for me to stop? I will, I will. Okay, okay. Rafa okay. said, don't use your paper. See, I didn't, but that's the danger. I will go on and on. Okay. Promise not to. All right. So we, we had workshops in the Portuguese settlement with members of the community to get feedback. And we talked about what shall we put in the book? What, what, what do we do? You know, what do we put in this book in terms of content? We said we must include cultural elements. Right? Not just like your usual textbook. We must include culture. And so in that way, we started thinking, what topics shall we cover? What are the main topics people want, want to talk about in Malacca Portuguese? Okay? And then, very, very importantly, and this is what we fought about for hours, the spelling and the pronunciation. Because there is no standard pronunciation. Okay? Um, and people spell it differently depending on what their language background um, is. Okay? So in doing that, let me just show you examples of the, some of the cultural elements we put in. So we put in some figurative expressions. Some of, you, some of you have a postcard which has these, so you can go and use these on other people, right? Um, this is very typical. All Malaysians are guilty of this, right? Big eyes, small stomach, right? You order everything, put in front of you. You go buffet, you, you pile up your food, and then you cannot eat, right? Okay? Um, and uh, probably another one that's my favorite is this one. Okay, that the food is so delicious that even if your mother-in-law, my mother-in-law is here today together with my mother. <laughs> so sorry, auntie, if I don't see you, it's because the food is so delicious, I don't even realize that she's fasting. Okay? So these are such, you know, um, a lot of these have, 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 they're funny, but you know, this is how people used to speak. And in Malay as well, people were never like direct. People always used to have another way of speaking. And we are losing this way of talking to each other. Right now we are like, eh, go to hell, lah, okay? Right? But there were other ways to be sarcastic and was in the language. Okay, we also included some little stories, stories that many people have forgotten. And you know, like stories of old, they always have a moral value and they're much more interesting than the moral stories you get in your school textbooks, right? So actually, actually textbooks should be using these stories from, from our communities. And this is about two kinds of fish and how this one fish was laughing at the other fish because his, his mouth was saying it, you know, and the word saying it is there. And he laughed so much that his bones got soft. And so now he's like the soft bone creature. So the moral is don't laugh at other people's you know, physical appearance or, or, or disabilities because uh, it, will, it will come back to you in some way, right? So, but, but imagine this and if you illustrate this and kids learn from this, how, how, how much more exciting than learning about Tom and Jerry going to, you know, having an Easter weekend, which we kind of have in our textbooks now. Okay, should stop there, I'll get into trouble, right? Okay, right. We also included songs, we included elements about festivals. This is a very, um, I think this one a lot of people know, the music that we walked into, that was Dinkley Nona, right? Okay, um, so we included this so that when people, when people use this book, read this book, they're not just, um, they're not just learning the language, they're also learning about the culture. And that's what we wanted to infuse in it, right? Um, I'll just touch on one of the things about how can we stick to spelling, okay? Because this is where research, um, my, at least my research contributed, uh, um, not, I wouldn't say contributed, but this is where we had to, we had to really discuss how to work on this, okay? Um, I just, don't worry, see this is the things I come up with, right? So this is my vowel chart, and then we had issues. Because in letters, we have like what? A, E, I, O, U, but those are letters. But what about, what if you have E, but the E can be E, uh, the E can be A, the E can be E. Am I gonna have three different E's or one E? We have to decide, right? What if I have two kinds of O? I have O 
like Malay orang, but I also have O, like English pot. Two different sounds, but I only have one O. So different languages make different decisions about how to represent this. Now, in most Kristang books or most Malacca Portuguese books, they just use one E, one O. But in discussion with the Malacca Portuguese Eurasian Association reps, they wanted it to reflect, where's our Portuguese heritage in all of this? Can't it look like Portuguese, which has the acute, the accent, right? So we said, okay, but we have to be careful uh, because Portuguese spelling is complicated, very complicated. And we don't want to go that way because most of our uh, people here are only used to Malay and English and both these languages now, Malay as well now, does not use any accents, right? Malay of old, yes, but not now. So in the end, we did use it, but only for A and uh, E. I won't go into the specifics, but I just want to tell you that I came in thinking, hey, keep it simple, you know, no need for accents. And then the community is like, uh, no, why not? Why can't we use accents? And then we had to debate. And this is part of the sharing process. And this is part of the, the challenge that researchers have to go in humble. Researchers ha cannot go in, I know everything, because my research shows this, OK? I don't care what you say. No, you have to listen especially when it comes to language, you are not the experts and your, your, your community members are not your subjects. This is not a lab experiment, okay? They are your language consultants. You have to remember that. And it is not easy to move from looking at spectrograms and waveforms on a computer to going into the community and talking to real people, not just the computer, okay? Right, so the outcomes, just, just to share, right? By doing these things, what are the outcomes that we can expect? Okay. Earlier I showed you, right, that we basically do research, then documentation, and then this is where we start moving on with community projects. And in my case, I work with the Malacca Portuguese Eurasian Association, many of whom live in the Portuguese settlement. We also did consult with the head of the headman, right, of the settlement, and also other people to ask them, how do you pronounce this? How do you say this? Is, this another, is there another way to say it? Okay. Um, but this is where things start getting valuable, right? Where it starts creating an impact, where the materials from the project supports ongoing classes, and also self-learning, okay? Um, oops, okay. And of course, we can't stop there. We can stop, then we'll be back to that half circle. So we actually have to go on, and sometimes it's like, oh no, do I really have to do this, okay? Because it takes up a lot of time away from your, and the, and the KPI outputs are not visible. I believe that the Linguistic Society of America, I may be wrong here, is actually re-looking how documentation work can be considered as on par with uh, publication. They're trying to do some kind of, um, um, what's the word to use? You know, they're trying to see equivalence, I guess, okay, to that documentation work, which requires a lot of uh, science and know-how. How can that be also valued as a journal or a book publication? Okay, so we review and we should be willing to go on and try to, because it doesn't stop, right? We have to review, we have to see where we can make it better, and, um, and we keep going on until that language perhaps can survive on its own. And ultimately, when we do knowledge sharing, we must make sure that the community can also do it. So when we're not there, they can go on this cycle on their own, especially the parts here, right? These parts, they can, go, they can do this on their own. And I'm happy to say, I mean, looking at what uh, Sarah and Philo are doing in the settlement, they are doing a fine job of it. I, I can step back and go on my sabbatical after this. Okay. Right. So the, the, the uh, outcomes, just to summarize, are that by doing language work, especially with minority communities, these others, okay, or the very small 0.01%, okay, um, you can legitimize their identity, their being, their language. It is a language. It is not a bastardized version of Portuguese. Okay, there's no like learn the proper Portuguese. There's no proper Portuguese. There's Portuguese, European Portuguese, Brazilian Portuguese, African Portuguese, and Malacca Portuguese, okay? Standing on the same level, just used differently, okay? Um, and it empowers the community to want to do something to take charge of their language because now they have the skills to do it, right? Okay, um, and the skills that they can use to do their own materials now. They know how we've gone through the first cycle they should be able to now produce more materials on their own, all right? And as I said earlier, they're using social media a lot to share, and that's one of the best ways to reach out to the, to the 
um, young community, okay? And, and this is what I like the best, previously it was me, it was other people outside the community who were talking about their language to others, okay? But now I've seen Philo, uh, you know, present at conferences, I've seen Sarah do talks on uh, elements of the language and culture, I've seen, um, I've seen many community members do it, okay? So this is what we want, that they become advocates of their own language. They do not need others to tell people about their language and to make decisions uh, about their language, okay? And I think also important, now more people know about Melaka Portuguese. I'm sure before this work, a lot of people in the university had no clue what Melaka Portuguese was all about, right? But more and more people know about it now. And it's not all fun and games, okay? There are a lot of challenges moving from research to um, working with communities, okay? And so, um, uh, consent and acceptance. If people don't want you there, then there's no point. You just walk away and say, thank you very much, and publish your work, right? But if there is an avenue to work with people and contribute back, then you should do it, okay? The commitment, you need commitment from you, and that's hard as an academic, but you need commitment from the community. That's not always going to be easy to get. Okay, so you have to negotiate that. Um, and you need champions. You the champion, your group, your team, but you need champions in the community. Because if it's just you doing it, you can, you can forget it, okay? No, no point. And um, collaboration. So it is very much a collaborative effort. It is not university going in and saying, do this, do this. This is good for you, okay? And you have to take into account everything else that's happening in the community, the politics, the, 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 the economics, the social things, everything. The environment, changing environment, everything has to be taken into um, consideration, the whole ecology of things, okay? And um, as, as I said, right, conflict is always going to be there. This is the hardest thing to do, in negotiating uh, community conflict and politics, okay, very, very difficult, can't please everyone, and everyone will have something to say about the name of the language, to the spelling, to uh, why you didn't involve so-and-so in this project, so it is, these are the skills that, uh, unfortunately, that's the one we are not trained for, so maybe in our training, we need these skills, the, the skills to deal with, to work with communities, these are not skills we are trained for, okay? Um, and of course, cash and time, right? Cash as in, you know, we need funding, the projects, and we can't just keep, keep hoping that University of Malaya will, will fund this. So we have to go out and look, who can fund us? Maybe, maybe governments, yeah, local governments, maybe, maybe tourism, if it's related. So where can we go for funds? And we have to, usually it's the university lecturers that have avenues and know how to do these uh, proposals. So working with the communities, this is where we need to uh, work on. So these are all the challenges, right, that uh, we have to, be willing to face, okay? And so, just coming to my last slide, you'll be happy to know, see, I'm almost on time, okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, sharing and engaging, that's what I want to talk about today, right? So my passion for sounds could have stayed at, this, at the level of just, you know, just doing this, recording people and documenting people. Here am I uh, recording a, a fisherman who is talking about it, the net he uses to, to catch uh, prawns, uh, a fish, okay? And then that's um, my two research assistants, Adri and Raihan, recording Philo, right? Um, and we can stop there. And then we do the analysis, you know, we, we sit together, we crack our minds listening to sounds a thousand times until the sounds are O's and the O's are in our heads, okay? Um, and then we can either document it or we can just simply and publish and stop. That's it. Very easy to do, this half cycle, right? And, and happily do it. But then you have to ask yourself, I, uh, you know, there's a social obligation. There's a moral obligation, really, for us to give back. A lot of our funding is public funding. So shouldn't we be giving back to society, right? Then, so we have to think about, can we do something to help the community, um, to produce materials, to help in the teaching, support the teaching. Um, and, and here are some children who came to UM, actually, from Malacca, and, and handled the class, right? They actually uh, were going around teaching people and getting people here at UM to practice how to speak. Um, Kristang. So, all in all, this cannot stop and this has to be a continuous loop and you can see how difficult this is to do. Uh, but I would urge those of you who are researchers here, think how you can actually give back. Even if you're working in school, how can you give back to the communities that you so happily go and 
basically, basically you data mine, right? You go there, terrible. It's a very colonialistic attitude. You go in, you take, you go. You, you reap the benefits of the, the riches, right? Okay? I'm not a communist, but yeah. <laughs> All right. And to just to, to, before I end, this is engagement. This is sharing. This is not transfer, one-way transfer. You have to be willing to be involved in a two-way process. Uh, and, and for many academics, this is very difficult for them. Okay? All right. So, with that, and thank you very much. Terima kasih. Muito merci. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, if my lecture on phonetics had been just a tiny little bit like you, I, I do not think I would have fared so badly in that subject. Uh, but really, um, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, a huge round of applause for Professor Stephanie. I'd like to call upon Dato Awang to uh, give a few closing remarks on the inaugural lecture. Dato. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Surin. You know, uh, I've chaired many uh, inaugural lectures I think over the last five and a half years, as I said earlier. And uh, all this while, whenever I chair in an inaugural lecture, I I have to listen very closely to the uh, to the speaker and then uh, try to summarize. And most of the time, it's it's not my field anyway, so. I struggled to do this. So I thought, for the first time ever, I'd ask her to write the summary for me and uh, for me to read out, <laughs> read out the summary. Now, people might say, my God, after five and a half years, five and a half years you've only come to realize that. <laughs> Slow learner. <laughs> but anyway, I, you know, every inaugural lecture that I, I go to, I, I learn something new. And, uh, and, in, and on this occasion, I, I learned uh, more than one new thing. I, uh, I'm from Sarawak, as uh, many of you might know. I'm uh, part Melanau and part Malay, half Melanau, half Malay. Unfortunately, I don't speak Melanau, <laughs> <laughs> which is really pity. Yes, I speak Malay, the standard Malay. I speak Sarawak Malay. I also speak Kedah Malay. Um, it's very well. I speak a smattering of uh, Hokkien, which I have to get by because I work in Penang and, and Kuching, so if you can't speak to your patients in Hokkien, that may, might be a problem also. <laughs> so, but I did learn uh, a few things today. One, my wife was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, my wife speaks uh, Malay, she speaks English, she speaks Mandarin because she went to a Chinese school for 12 years, so she speaks fluent Mandarin. And she always says that, how many languages can you speak? I said, okay, I can speak Malay and English, probably not very well too, but uh, <laughs> still I can speak Malay and English. But today I've learned that I can add two more languages. <laughs> 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 because Sarawak Malay apparently is a language on its own, yes, okay. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I can tell her, look, I'm not inferior to you in this respect. <laughs> <laughs> My first lesson. Secondly, now being, being part Melanau and not being able to speak Melanau has always uh, trou troubled me. My father never taught me uh, Melanau. Uh, and it's, it's a pity that I, I did not learn uh, Melanau during, during my years, uh, primarily because there aren't many, many Melanaus in Kuching. And it was, it was a real challenge trying to get somebody to speak uh, Melanau to me. So it's, it's difficult to pick it up at, at my age, you know, five years to retirement, you know, you can't teach an old dog new tricks in this case. I, you can't teach an old doctor new tricks. <laughs> <laughs> so when, before Prof. Stephanie's uh, inaugural lecture, I, I asked her, oh, why, can you just tell me, why is it that you did so much research in, in Malacca particularly? Is it something to do with your ancestry? And it turned out that your grandmother 
your mother. Your mother is not of Jesus. So, I must say, you are one up on me. <laughs> <laughs> I never learned to speak Malano despite my, my father being, being Malano. And I must, I, must, uh, I must say, hopefully Malano is not one of the endangered languages. If not, I would be contributing to that. <laughs> it is? Oh dear. <laughs> okay. Now, uh, a few a few years ago, when we when I was uh, deputy vice chancellor for research and innovation in, in 2013, uh, we started something called the Grand Challenge approach to research, and uh, the idea was, when you do research, it should not stop at journal publications, because the research is meaningless if it's just written in a journal and put on a shelf somewhere. In, in our case, as a PDF file somewhere in your hard disk. So true research is when you translate this and it benefits the community and benefits the country. So the Grand Challenge approach, which started in uh, 2013, is now expanded. And we want uh, people to identify a real problem in the community and use their, their knowledge in research methodology to get them to do something about that problem so that the community actually benefits. So, Stephanie, is it uh, Pilai or Pile? Pile, so sorry. For Stephanie Pile's work with the Malacca Portuguese community, now I'm reading from what she, she's written for me. <laughs> it's an excellent example of how researchers should shift away from a uh, grab and Go research model sounds like take away, okay. take away, yes. research model to one which engages the community to address the needs of those communities. And she, as she mentioned at the top, the University of Malaya, um, right from my time, we we have played, uh, we have, we have made sure that UMCAS gets at least a million in funding every year to give out knowledge transfer grants and community engagement grants because we believe that. We should not be like any other research university where we do research for the sake of research. So, I am glad to see that Prof. Stephanie Pile has been following the Grand Challenge approach. She has been training local researchers on language documentation theory and methods together with her collaborators uh, like uh, Professor Peter Austin, for example, from SOAS and under this Newton Uncle Omar Fellowship. She has also extended this to the community itself and made sure that the community benefits from this. I'm excited to know that, that she's thinking of uh, developing an app, is that right, an app, where this can further benefit um, Malacca Portuguese and how this language uh, can, be, can be preserved and so that the future generations of Malacca Portuguese do not uh, feel so bad that their language is dying. I, I really feel so bad now that uh, <laughs> that Malana now seems to be dying. It. <laughs> you know, when you add this dimension of community engagement and knowledge sharing to the language research cycle, as she has uh, very aptly uh, demonstrated, it can help to ensure the survival of this particular language. Of course, engaging with communities uh, is not easy. We, we know that when we try to engage the communities. People have different uh, expectations. We have different expectations. And we have to meet halfway, where uh, both expectations have to be met. Perhaps not fully, but uh, most of it. Anyway, all right. I hope that her example in leading the way in uh, research on Malacca Portuguese Trust me, she's made a lot of headlines in, in, on websites and, and news, even uh, appearing in, in Singaporean uh, news straits, time, uh, sorry, straits Times in, in Singapore uh, about her work on the survival of an endangered language. I do hope that her example will inspire other researchers who are present today and perhaps who will later watch this YouTube video, which we've put on YouTube, about how you can make your research 
relevant to society. So on that note, and with the inspiring example which Prof. Stephanie Pillay has shown us, please join me in congratulating Prof. Stephanie Pillay on a most inspiring inaugural lecture. Thank you, Dato. Um, I'd like to call upon Professor Stephanie to give Dato Awang a little token of appreciation for being the chair today. And yes, yeah, cancelling his leave and, and, and joining us. And perhaps also a little bit of a good luck token for his sabbatical. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of our proceedings today. Um, I thank you very much for being here and sharing with us um, you know, um, our experience of this inaugural lecture. I'm sure that uh, each and every one of you will have something to think about today. Um, thank you very much for coming. Please join us in refreshments at Dewan Mangkula. Our ushers will show you the way if you're not aware. But uh, do join us for refreshments. As Steph says, there is devil curry. And a little bird has told me that there's tose on demand as well. So please, come join us. Thank you.